over the years I've made a series of videos about the lesser known Japanese video disc format of VHD. Now this was supposed to come out in the UK and the US, but for reasons and circumstances that I've covered in previous videos, it only ever came out in Japan, where it was a modest success. It always played second fiddle to Laserdisc though. It was offering much of the capabilities of Laserdisc, but at a slightly lower resolution and at a lower price. But as we've seen so many times before, when a product, a consumer electronics product, is based around a price advantage, it's a product that's really built on shifting sands. And when the competitors can reduce their component costs due to economies of scale, quite often that price advantage gets eroded and therefore people will gravitate towards the more desirable product rather than the cheap one. And that's what happened here. VHD came out in the early 1980s. It met its most success in the mid 80s, but by the end of the 80s, it had died off and just really fell into the karaoke market. However, there was one thing that VHD could do that Laserdisc couldn't, and that's 3D. And we're talking proper field sequential 3D here with LCD shutter glasses that alternate the displays to each eye. So you get a full color display, unlike your cardboard glasses with your red and green, red and blue anaglyph. This is much the same as the system that we came to experience later on via Blu-ray 3D. But you've got to think this was the mid 80s, 1985. This is about 25 years before the rest of the world got to experience 3D in full colour off a home video disc system. Well, back in Japan, they were experiencing the same thing, although at a much lower quality. But let's have a look at the system, the setup that you need to be able to experience 3D in Japan in the mid 1980s. It took me quite a few years to get all these things together. We'll start off with the VHD player. Not all players are capable of 3D, but this HD 9300 is. As you can see on the front panel, we've got the appropriate socket to connect up our 3D glasses. Now, if you had a VHD player without that feature built in, as long as it has an AHD socket on the rear, that could then be linked up to an external 3D adapter to which you'd connect up your glasses. And there were a variety of styles of 3D glasses. This is Victor's 3D scope, gloriously 1980s looking font on there, big wide visor on the front. But if we flip it around, we can see inside there are separate LCD shutters for each eye. Now this just plugs into the front of the machine with a standard three and a half mil mini jack. But of course there is an extension lead that you attach to that so that you can sit across the room. Of course, all this would be useless without some 3D movies to watch. I've collected together an assortment. We've got Jaws 3D, The House of Wax, Friday the 13th, Part 3, and Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin, which, according to IMDb, was the first animated 3D feature. Finally, I need a screen to view these on. I'm going to be using this professional JVC CRT that dates from 2004. Ideally, I'd want a bigger screen than this, but it's the largest CRT that I own. It's capable of producing a high-resolution picture via component, but that's going to be no use here as VHD only outputs composite video. So with the glasses or visor connected and a disc loaded, I can experience 3D VHD for the first time 37 or so years after it came out. The first thing you notice when you put that visor on is how much it dims down the image on the screen. These are working just fine, but even with the brightness on the monitor turned up as far as it will go and the lights in the room dimmed down, it really does take your eyes some time to become accustomed to this change in brightness. Ideally, I'll be able to try this out on a brighter and larger screen than I've got here, but the tech was designed to work with CRTs. So when I tried it with an LCD TV, the polarization on the glasses was at a 45 degree angle to the TV screen, and that resulted in a blacked out image. A quick test with my small OLED TV resulted in a brighter image, but unfortunately the timing of the shutters was out of sync, which led to a double image. And unsurprisingly, a similar thing happened when I attempted to use this with my main large OLED TV. So I've got to use this with the CRT or nothing. Another big issue is flicker. 
any light source at all within your peripheral vision flickers wildly through the glasses. Now, this was a known issue, and they included clip-on blinkers for the visor to try and mitigate the problem. But in my experience, the only comfortable way to watch one of these 3D discs is in almost complete darkness. It's a matter of turning off the light and closing the curtains. But then finally, when you've settled down to watch your movie, it's clear that some of these transfers aren't the greatest. Friday the 13th in particular is very soft. It reminds me of a second gen VHS bootleg. So perhaps it's not such a hardship to watch these on a smaller screen after all, because the larger you blow them up, the worse they look. So all these things combined to make this a less than ideal viewing experience, uh, more of a novelty than anything else. VHD as a format existed before the 3D part came along and after it the 3D bit was just a, a brief blip in the middle. It came and went in the blink of a shutter. But talking of which, let's just explain exactly how the system worked. So first off, let's just have a look how a normal VHD displays its image and then compare that to the 3D version. This is a VHD disc out of one of the caddies, and on one of these you can hold 60 minutes of video on either side. These things are spun at 900 RPM inside the machine, and on each side you can have approximately 45,000 concentric rings that contain the video and audio information. These are read with a capacitive stylus that tracks over the top. One rotation of the disc contains two frames of video, or four video fields. And once it's read those two frames of video, the stylus jumps into the next ring along and so on to read the whole disc. Now you'll notice the fact that there are two frames of video per rotation when you try and do a freeze frame because you keep your stylus in the same position, but the disc is still rotating. And as a result, you'll see those two frames of video displayed. Now, sometimes there might be no movement on screen for two frames and you get a perfect still frame. Other times when there is movement, you'll see the jumping back and forth between those two frames. But the ability of the stylus to jump in through these concentric rings enables quite a lot of interactive capabilities. I believe you could get from something at one end of the disc to the other end of the disc in under four seconds. But more importantly, you can jump between those rings seamlessly and you could even skip one or perhaps more without there being any breakup in the video whatsoever. Now you can see this in interactive game demonstrations. You could attach an MSX computer up to a VHD and you could have different video on say the even rings to the odd rings. And if you wanted to jump seamlessly between whatever was playing on either of those two things with your computer, you'd press your buttons and it would jump to the next one. And this is the system that's used for the 3D. Rather than holding two frames of video per side, we've got one frame of video for the right eye, one for the left eye. However, the 3D movies are also backwardly compatible and can be played in 2D. And that is uh, pretty clever how they managed to do that. I've got a little diagram over here that I'll use to explain. Okay, now this is a rather crude diagram. It's only got six rings on here rather than the 45,000 that are on the real disc. But you can imagine this is a little bit easier to see. We have a right eye and then a left eye image, and then it continues like that throughout the disc. And the stylus moves in once it's done a full rotation to the next ring along. Now that works fine for 3D, but there's a button on the front of the machine here, and you can press it, and you can watch this 3D movie as a 2D movie. And the way that that works is it changes the way the stylus tracks across the disc. Rather than it doing a full rotation, you get to see the right eye in red here. Once it gets halfway through, it jumps the stylus into the next ring along, and that's the right eye there, and it jumps it to the next one along again. So you're just watching the right eye image all the way through. The only issue with that is though, by jumping, we've missed the audio that would have accompanied the left eye image. And you might think it's not important, but it would be very stuttery if you were to watch the whole movie and you're missing effectively half the audio that should be there. So to get around this they've repeated the audio that would have been on the left eye on the right eye image that's on this next ring along but then that raises the issue if you were to play it as a 3d one you'd hear that audio repeated so the way it works in 3d is the stylus skips it plays this ring it skips the next one it plays the next one along so it's jumping through the odd rings on the disc and when you're watching in 2D, you're getting half the ring played and then it jumps into the next one. It's very complicated as far as uh, mastering these discs go, but 
it enabled a 3D disc to be played in 2D. The only issue with this system is that it jumps through a disc at twice the speed that you get on a normal one because we're jumping through the rings quicker. Therefore, your 3D movies have to come on more discs. This movie would normally have fitted on one VHD. In this case, it has to fit on two and each of these can hold around right about half an hour on each side. So every half hour, you're gonna take this out, flip it over, play the other side. And of course, as a result of having more discs, the 3D titles would also be more expensive. And overall, it really just wouldn't have been worth it for most people back then. I'm sure even the people that bought this setup would have lost interest in it pretty quickly. The trouble was the 3D effect just wasn't all that impressive. We're talking very low resolution. And we're looking at the 3D as an effect that seems to fall back from the frontal pane. So really you get the people at the front talking and then you get the 3D effect behind them for the scenery. But because it's such a low resolution, your eye isn't drawn to that background. You don't notice the depth so much because it's just mush, especially when you get a 2.35 to one aspect ratio squashed along the top of the screen. You only look at a fraction of the resolution of the full image, over composite in 3D with a flicker. It just isn't really a great experience at all. As far as Friday the 13th goes, well, that one skipped a lot. I've got some issues with the age of these discs that the uh, lubrication, I think, has dried out a little bit on some of them. So the stylus is skipping around. But even so, Friday the 13th, very dark film. You can't, can't really watch very dark 3D. You need nice bright scenery. That's why it works so particularly well with all the animations. But talking of animation, it didn't work very well with this one because they seem to just use two panes, really, for the 3D. You've got the cells at the front, so then you've got the background again, and it didn't add anything to the film at all. Finally, House of Wax, that was the one that I had the best experience with. I watched quite a bit of this. It seemed to have a reasonable 3D effect. I think it was helped by the fact that it was filling up the full screen. So I'm getting a higher resolution, but you could have just quite as easily watched it in 2D and not felt like you'd missed out on anything. It didn't really add to the experience. And of course, we've also got the aspect that everyone that has to watch these films has to wear some 3D goggles. They've got to get them plugged into the front of the machine. Now you could attach multiple ones of these. You could use a splitter on this device or there was a box available that you could attach four sets of 3D glasses. So everyone could sit there watching this. But can you imagine a, a house with a little screen at the front, four people with these things on, straining, looking at the blurry image, trying to get the 3D out of it? No, you can see why it wasn't a success. I applaud the effort but it was a little bit too early for the tech, and as a result, it just uh, wasn't very impressive. The films I've got here cover two periods of 3D movies. The House of Wax dates to 1953, what was known as the golden age of 3D movies. At this point, they were using a dual projector system to show 3D, and these were viewed using polarised glasses. Now, 3D was used to try and attract audiences away from their new television sets and back into the movie theatres by offering something that they couldn't experience at home. Hollywood abandoned 3D, though, a few years later, when widescreen movie presentations became a more successful way to attract those audiences. But then we move on to the early 1980s movies. These used a single strip anamorphic process that had been introduced with 1969's The Stewardesses, an R-rated feature that with a budget of $100,000 made $27 million. So again, 3D was tried out as a potential response to the early home video boom, giving audiences a reason to leave their homes and visit the cinema. A few mainstream films were produced using this anamorphic 3D process, but the fact that the films themselves just weren't very good pretty much sealed the fate of this brief 3D revival. For a while, 3D presentations then became the preserve of theme parks and IMAX documentaries until 2004's 3D IMAX showings of Polar Express indicated a renewed level of mainstream interest in 3D, which led to a 3D cinema boom. But again, this is one that now seems to have largely burned itself out. Now, I've always been into 3D. There's a, a 3D picture of me, if we get it focused. You can see some lights got into the lens there. Well, that's from a long time ago. That was taken with a Nimslo 3D camera, I think, or something very similar to that. Uh, so it's a lenticular print. Uh, but going back to being a child, I've got books about 3D and comics and 
as I grew up. Of course, we've got the uh, Virtual Boy. I bought that not when it was a collector's item, but when it actually came out. And of course, 3DS and Blu-ray 3D. But one of the things I bought as a result of this fascination with the subject of 3D was this, the Ultimate 3D Collection. This is after I got my DVD player in 98. This came out around right about 2001 and it contained 3D shutter glasses, an adapter to attach up to a DVD player and some 3D movies that had originated as IMAX 3D. After buying that, I then went looking for more content for it. And one of the discs that I got at the time was this. <laughs> familiar title, Jaws 3D. And I didn't realise at the time when I got this, this was around about 2001, but I don't know if you can see at the top there, this has been directly taken as a copy from this VHD, in fact, it had the Japanese subtitles on it as well. And at the time I was wondering, why has it got Japanese subtitles on this? I knew it was a copy, but I was thinking, what kind of Japanese system would have had 3D? It just shows you how far ahead of the time this was, that 16 years later, people were still selling copies of the video from this rather dodgily on DVD. But the truth is, I mean, it, it still looked terrible, however you try and watch it. So yeah, this was a, a very short-lived bit of entertainment in my house, but it's just indicative of the fact that throughout my life, I've always been fascinated with 3D, which is why I really wanted to try out this 3D VHD system. Now, whilst 3D on VHD was not the greatest of successes or even the greatest of experiences, when 3D finally came into the home in the West on a larger scale, and it was either on the TV or via 3D Blu-ray, of course, I bought into that, having the interest in 3D, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great experience. And I was watching via a um, 3D OLED TV, which rather than doing interlaced would give you full 1080p in both eyes. It was a 4K OLED. I'd watch with passive glasses. I'd got some clip-ons. There was no issue, of course, with flicker with no recharging any of that business. And um, one benefit to it, which uh, hardly anyone ever mentions, is it really stopped you doing two screen watching. You know, you've got that thing when you're watching a movie and then you think, oh, what was he in? And you get your phone out or your tablet or whatever and start looking it up and then you start getting engrossed in some notifications or whatever the latest news is. You end up watching two things at once and not really paying attention to either of them. Well, with the polarised glasses, you look down at a tablet or a phone and you can't really see the screen. So you just carry on watching the films. But I think the fact that I was kind of forced to watch the whole thing all the way through, uh, lights dimmed a little bit, really added to the experience. So I've got some very fond memories of watching 3D movies on my OLED TV. Unfortunately, that TV died. I had to replace it. 3D are gone. You couldn't get an OLED TV with passive 3D anymore. And my new larger OLED, it's a great TV, but I can't watch 3D on it. So all my 3D Blu-ray movies, they're all just sitting on the shelf. That is the 3D VHD system. I enjoyed looking at it. It wasn't the best, but I do enjoy playing around with this old tech. But we've ticked off 3D VHD. I hope you enjoyed having a look at this here today. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.